Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, what an amazing thought that you would give us your son as a savior. We have eternal life with you because you gave us your son and you sent him here. I pray as we look at your word, you would help us to remember him well. Remember him for who he is and what he did. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, now we're at the point in our service where we are going to remember Christ around his table. And this is a time for Christians to remember what Christ did for them in his work on their behalf at the cross. In a few moments, we're going to be taking a wafer and a bit of juice. And it's important for us to know that these are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ that were offered on behalf of all of those who would put their trust in him. We're going to be using a passage this morning where God shows us two elements of his love, two characteristics of his love. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to 1 John chapter 4? We're going to be looking at verse 10 together. And if you don't have a Bible, some men are going to be coming down the aisles and they can get a Bible in your hands. Just raise your hand and let them know that. And if you don't actually own a Bible, please consider this our gift to you so that you can begin reading God's word for yourself. In chapter four, John is making the case that God is love. He does that in a number of ways. So we get to verse 10. I want you to be looking at a couple of different things. One is uh, what is the context of God's love? And then what is the evidence of God's love? So follow along with me as I read verse 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John starts by saying, this is the context of love. This is the true definition of love. If you want to know what love is, look at this. And then he moves on to show us what love is not. And he says something that's, that's very, very helpful to us. He says, love is not that we have loved God. John is making a point here. And John is saying that the present state of our relationship with God as a believer's is not because of any expression of love that we made to God in the past as unbelievers. There is no expression of love that the unbeliever makes towards God that contributes to the state of their relationship with God because they don't actually love God. John is saying that to the unbeliever, there is nothing that you offer to me. God is saying there's nothing at all that you offer to me. Then God turns away from what love is not. And he turns to what it is. And here he talks about something that actually did occur in the past. He talks about two things. And he said, the first thing that love is, is that God actually loved us. You can point to a clear evidence of something that took place in the past that demonstrates that God loved us. From other places in our Bibles, we know that God loved us by demonstrating a number of things. He loved us by foreknowing us. Before the foundations of the world, God knew us intimately and understood everything that we would do. And yet, in spite of all of those things, he had plans for our good, for the believer. God also loved us by predestining us to be conformed to the image of Christ. We bear Christ's image to the world around us. He loved us by drawing us to himself with an irresistible call that we could not resist. He loved us by declaring us to be righteous on the basis of faith that he gave to us as a gift. And he loved us by securing our place in eternity with him on the basis of the work that Christ did for us. So God loved us. Love is not that man tried to love God in his unbelief. Love is that God actually acted. There was an event that occurred. He made plans for us. But John also says that there's another feature of God's love, and that is that he sent his son. And again here, the emphasis on the occurrence of something that took place in the past at the time John was writing. God sent his son into this world. God forfeited the presence of Christ with him in heaven so he could send him to be with us here in this world. And God tells us the purpose why he sent John, or why he sent Christ. He sent Christ to be the propitiation for our sins. And when we think about propitiation for sins, we have to think about one and one thing only. And that is the satisfaction of God's wrath against the one who would believe. So when Christ came down into this world, he came down to this world and he lived a perfect life so he could be the substitute in place of all of those who would believe. And what he did was he took in his body the sin of all of those who had placed their trust in him. 
And then he took on the guilt associated with that sin. And because of that guilt and that sin, he himself bore the Father's wrath in the place of the one who deserves that wrath for all of those who would trust in Christ as their Savior and their Lord. So that's what God did to demonstrate his love. He actually loved by making plans for us. And then he sent his son into this world to actually accomplish the saving work that he had planned for us all along. So believer, this morning when the elements come to you, meditate on the work that Christ has done in your place. Meditate on his work at that cross. Somewhere between three and six hours, he hung on that cross and did the hard work of enduring all of the torment and the agony that was necessary to satisfy God's wrath against you. And then when your heart is prepared, just take the elements on your own. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior and your Lord, I want to point you back to the words of verse 10, that Christ is the propitiation for our sins. What God is telling us there is that there is one and only one means by which he saves people. And that is through the work of Christ that he does on the cross. The person who puts their trust in Christ recognizes one thing about Christ, and that is that he is the Son of God. And there are two implications from that, that because he's the Son of God, his death on the cross was sufficient to accomplish salvation of everyone who would put their trust in him. So his death on the cross is one thing. But another implication of Christ actually being the Son of God is that he is worthy of being the one who we worship. He is worthy of the one who we follow. He actually is the Lord of our lives. Now, unbeliever, when you're here this morning, you'll see lots of people this morning taking the elements. All of these people one day were at the place where you were in your life. But what they did was they recognized about the person of Jesus Christ that he was the Son of God. And they recognized that his work on the cross was sufficient to secure their salvation. And they recognized that as the Son of God, he was worthy of their submission to his lordship over their life. After the service, there's going to be somebody up here in the corner. They are ready to talk to you about what it looks like to have a relationship with Christ, what God's word says about how you can know Christ in a saving way. Men come and serve us, and I'll close our time in prayer.